So, welcome back for, for week two of our look through the book of Revelation. Last week we started our journey through the book of Revelation and the starting point for that was to look at the verse that serves as the master key to understanding this, this whole book. It's chapter 1, verse 19, and that reveals the overall structure of the book of Revelation when it says, Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Now what you have seen, as we saw last week, was Jesus. John saw the risen Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The living one who had died, who says, look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. That's Revelation 1 verse 18. What you have seen, the past, what is now and what will take place later, the past, the present and the future. And we looked at the, uh, 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 the past last week, so this week we're getting into the present, right what is now. Now this takes up the, the next two chapters, chapters 2 and 3, and the what is now refers to John's present time frame, which is still continuing today. It refers to what we call the church age. Jesus focuses on seven churches and instructs John to write down his words that are addressed to the angel of each of these churches or the messenger of those churches. Now, <clears throat> each, of, each of these churches were real, physical churches of John's day, and the message for each one related to each physical individual church. However, many theologians would see there being a wider message here with each individual church mentioned relating to a church age, all of which added up to the age or the era of the church. They would say, and I agree, that the seven churches that were picked out were not picked at random, but because they represented the growth stages of the church worldwide as seen over the past 2,000 years. Now, others would disagree and say that the messages to the churches were just for John's time, as I was highlighting last week. It's okay to disagree so long as we do it politely and with alternative positions that we've thought through. And that's what I'm attempting to do over these weeks of leading us through the book of Revelation. So let's get through, uh, through that now and see what, uh, see what you think. Well, the first letter that Jesus dictates to John is for the church at Ephesus. Now, this could be summed up as the church with something missing. The word Ephesus means darling or first. It's a term of endearment. You are the first in my heart. John was writing the book of Revelation in, in around 95 AD, and this first letter was to the church that was in existence from the time of Christ to around 100 AD. Something happened in 100 AD that changed the overall outlook of the church that we'll come to in a minute. But in 95 AD, the relationship that the church had with Jesus was like it was like a good marriage gone stale. Not bad, just cold. Jesus referred to them as darling, with love and tenderness. But, he says, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. That's uh, Revelation 2 verse 4. It was a church that was just going through the motions. It had lost its first love. Just 60 years after the death of Jesus and the birth of the church, things had gone stale. Return to me, Jesus begs of them. So what happened in AD 100? Well, persecution broke out, waves of it. Actually starting with the great wave of persecution that's mentioned in Acts chapter 8. There were numerous local persecutions 
and also empire-wide persecutions over the next 200 years, lasting until around 300 AD. Now this second age of the church is summed up by the church at Smyrna. The word Smyrna comes from the word myrrh, which is a, a burial spice. We know that from the story of the Magi who brought gold, frankincense and myrrh as prophetic gifts to Jesus at his birth. Myrrh gives off a fragrant aroma, aroma but not until it's crushed. Smyrna was well named because this second age of the church was marked by persecution, by being crushed. And the church was seen as the persecuted, as, as the persecuted church. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those opposing you, Jesus says to them in chapter 2, verse 9. And Jesus then reveals that you will be persecuted for 10 days. Now, before we start thinking, well, 10 days doesn't sound too bad, this is in fact symbolic of those 10 waves of persecutions that came upon the church over the next 200 years until the, the beginning of the 4th century AD. But around 300 AD, the beginning of the 4th century, there came another change which led into the third period of the church age. It was symbolised by the church in Pergamum, which could be summed up as the compromised church. Now this period of the church lasted from around AD 300 to AD 590. Pergamum literally means objectionable marriage. In this case, it symbolised the, the marriage between church and state. As the emperor, Constantine, declared that the Christian faith was to be seen as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Suddenly, what had been a persecuted minority became the means to get on in life. So sin became tolerated in the church. And yet I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you who are like Balaam, who showed Balak how to trick the people of Israel. He taught them to worship idols by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. There was great compromise in the church. Now, how was that allowed to happen? Well, it never works out well for the church when it is allied to the state. When the church becomes the state's mouthpiece, it's always the church that compromises or suffers rather than the state. The church of Constantine's time compromised by incorporating Christian events into pagan festivals such as Saturnalia, which became Christmas, and the pagan festival of Istra, or Easter which was used to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Christ. But there was another issue that came out of this objectionable marriage, and that's still with the church today. In the same way, you have some Nicolaitans among you, people who follow the same teaching and commit the same sins. Now, the word Nicolaitan comes from two Greek words. Nikos means conquering or power over, and laos meaning people, i.e. laity. The power over the people. You see, with the merging of church and state, with state effectively imposing itself on the church, came a worldly hierarchy. Leadership in the church became reflective of what was going on in the world. People were ruled over rather than served. Church governance came to be a reflection of the, the worldly quest for power. Now, how did all this change in AD 600? This was the beginning of what is known as the Dark Ages, and the light of the gospel grew very dim. The church grew more in the likeness of Babylonian mysticism than in Christ-likeness. This is the church symbolised by Thyatira. 
false religion referred to as Jezebel became prevalent. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She's encouraging them to worship idols, eat food offered to idols, and to commit sexual sin. Jesus says in chapter 2, verse 20. Take, for example, the sale of something called indulgences that began in 1190 AD. The idea was to raise money so individuals could give about one third of a year's income and purchase a piece of paper that said all their sins, past, present and future, were forgiven. Now this caused many to live their lives following the desires of their sinful nature in complete sin, sexual immorality and whatever else the flesh desired. Yet God in his mercy gave the church time to repent, almost a thousand years to come back. Yet the church refused. Thyatira is the church that symbolises this period, which is really the church of the Dark Ages. And it lasted until 1517 AD, which was when the next church age dawned, that being the Church of the Reformation. This is characterised by the church in Sardis and refers to the, the period of time from 1517 AD to 1648 AD. Now, you would think that this would be a church that Jesus would talk about in glowing terms, the Church of the Reformation, a return to the supremacy of the Bible, sola scriptura was the phrase, only scripture, a challenge to all of the uh, compromise and idolatry and misuse of power that had infected the church during the Dark Ages. And yet, he says, I know all the things that you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Now wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is at the point of death. What's interesting about this letter is that it is one of just two that has nothing positive to say other than that they are, there are some who have not soiled their garments with evil deeds. It's also pointing out the, the connection between right understanding, that is go back to what you heard and believed at first, hold to it firmly and turn to me again, and right action. Your deeds are far from right in the sight of God. Just as an aside, it was as a result of the Protestant Reformation that we now have so many denominations. Prior to the 16th century, there had been what was referred to as the Great Schism in 1045 AD, which was the break between the Roman Catholic Church in Rome and the Eastern Orthodox churches centred in Constantinople. But the next big dramatic church division took place during the Reformation. Out of this came Reformed, Anabaptist, Baptist, Mennonite, Presbyterian, Lutheranism, Methodism, Pentecostalism, Charismatic, Amish, Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist, Church of England, Church of Scotland, uh, Congregationalism, Salvation Army, and so on. St. Paul had said, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ, he said in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2. And yet suddenly the church was fracturing and splitting and denominations based on doctrinal differences, personal fallouts, power plays, and so on. What had been intended as the reformation of a corrupted hierarchical church actually brought in division and suspicion and huge arguments. And it's important to understand that those who see the letters to the seven churches in this prophetic way that I'm explaining now where the real church is mentioned also can be understood as being prophetic of periods of time, 
Well, they aren't saying that these different features were only for that one period of time. So the denominationalism that came in as a result of the Reformation, that's still very much with us. In fact, the World Christian Encyclopedia, for example, notes that there are in excess of 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries. Denominationalism wasn't just confined to the church in the age of Sardis. It was added in in that age and it remains with us today. As is the main feature of the church in Philadelphia. Now the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. This is the church that loved their brother enough to share the gospel. Philadelphia is the missionary church. The church that blossomed in the 1700s and the 1800s. The, the period of time during which the Great Awakening happened and the modern missionary movement took off. In 1800, around 1% of Protestant Christians lived in Asia, Africa and Latin America. By 1900, this number had grown to 10%. And today, at least 67% of all active Protestant Christians live in countries once considered foreign missionary fields. The 18th and 19th centuries saw the missionary emphasis of the church absolutely explode around the world. It was a time of open doors for traveling to previously unreached places, Africa, China, Korea, South America, India. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can shut. Yet you have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me, says Jesus to the church in Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 8. That brotherly love extended not just to preaching the gospel overseas, but to societal reform. With people like William Wilberforce and the Quakers and the abolitionists and John Newton campaigning to end slavery and child labour and so on. This was truly the golden age of the evangelical church and the missionary movement. And just in case we overly romanticise that time, Christian missionaries expected to die on the mission field, with some even taking their own coffins with them. Now, it would be unusual for a missionary to last for more than just a few years. The Lord had opened a door that no person was going to shut during that period. And even when the, the door to China was finally closed by Chairman Mao in 1948, by the grace of God, that caused the greatest expansion of Christianity the world had ever seen. What motivated the church of the 18th and 19th centuries to abandon all home comforts and go out around the world to spread the gospel? Brotherly love, Philadelphia. An open door that had been provided by God. But sadly, that's not where the story ends. Because the final church that is highlighted by Jesus Christ, the church at Laodicea, could be termed the apathetic church. From the missionary fervour of the Philadelphian church came the present day lukewarm church. One of the features of this church came from its name, Laodicea. Now obviously Laodicea is a real place. Today it's located near the city of Denizli in Turkey. But it has a prophetic significance. You see, Laodicea is the result of two Greek words, laos, meaning people, as we've already seen, and dikia, meaning rule. Whereas in Pergamum, the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans were tolerated, uh, the, the elite who ruled over ordinary people, here it's the rule of the people, not the rule of the elite over the people, but the rule of the people. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, 
rather than it, it, it being the Bible that directs the beliefs of the people, in the Laodicean church, the church of our modern age, it's the majority vote, the view of society in general that directs the beliefs of the church. Hell, judgment, sexuality, sex outside of marriage, gender issues, and so on. The church gets shaped into the mold of this world rather than this world being transformed by the radical, life-changing beliefs of the church. The church just goes along with the spirit of the age, neither hot nor cold, just Laodicean, apathetic. You say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. Well, in the Laodicean church, the focus is on worldly wealth, the prosperity gospel, bigger buildings, power ministry, reputation, respectability from the world. Don't rock the boat. Don't, don't take costly stands. Embrace the culture of the world around you. Measure success like the world around you measures success. But the Lord of the church says, I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire, then you will be rich. Verse 18. This then is the church age. We are not aimlessly drifting through history with history just repeating itself. We're headed towards something awesome. The church age will end and then the world will begin the third part of that master key that I mentioned back in chapter 1 verse 19. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. And next time we start to understand the what will take place later. Not everyone agrees with the view of what is now as I've just unpacked it. That's for you to weigh up and come to a position on. But one thing is for sure, we are nearer the end now than we have ever been. And next time as the focus of the action turns to heaven, what we can be sure of is that's where we are headed and headed soon. These are exciting times. So Father, I thank you that you have a plan. Jesus, Lord of the church, I thank you that you are working that plan out through the church that you said you would build as age succeeds to age. I thank you that we live in the age, I truly believe, where we will see the culmination of all things. But Lord, we want to repent right now of the ways in which we have been apathetic, where we have been like just part of the Laodicean church. We repent, Lord, of just allowing ourselves, our opinions, our worldview, our sense of right and wrong to be formed by the world around us rather than by your unchanging word. Lord, would you cause your church to rise up, to return to our first love and do the things that we did at first. Lord, would you shake us from our sleep Shake us from this cultural slumber. And Lord, may we see your church ready, ready to receive Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. And I pray it, I pray it for your church around the world, Lord. Wherever we're watching this, whether it's in the UK, India, Africa, the Philippines, Central America, where, wherever it is. Lord, we need a fresh visitation of your Holy Spirit to wake us up, to shape us up, to make us ready. And I ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone who's been watching uh, this series so far. It's, it's great to have so many people um, just going to YouTube and, and watching these videos. And I hope you'll stick with us as we reach um, number three next time and our attention turns from uh, what is now to what will be and our, our, our gaze turns towards heaven. It's an exciting talk. I hope you can join us. God bless you till then.